Hi everyone and welcome to the first Women on Stage conference. Thank you for being here today again. I'm super excited to be here and I'm thrilled to have all of you joining us again. My name is Moran Weber and I'm the CEO and founder of Women on Stage. And for those of you who weren't with us yesterday, Women on Stage is a global community platform to showcase, book, and train women professional tech speakers for any event, conference, meetup, or webinar. The platform was launched in May 2020 and achieved overnight viral success, already making it one of the largest databases in the world for, for women professional tech speakers. Our mission statement is to amplify women's voices and to create a world where women make at least 50% of tech speakers, because we believe that if you can see it, you can be it. Apart from the platform, three months ago, we've also launched the Women on Stage Academy course, which is a full-blown course to train the next generation of women on stages. And today is the second day for our ending conference where each of our 40 graduates will present their talks on two parallel tracks after they've been building and polishing their presentations throughout the course for the past three months after getting tailored personal feedback from world-class speakers. Our speakers are working in senior positions at some of the best known tech companies in the world. On top of that, we also have four keynote speakers opening each track. Yesterday we had two and there are two more today. Our speakers are going to present highly technical professional sessions covering data, machine learning, NLP, backend, cloud and big data, frontend, React, software languages, software architecture, and many more. Before we start, I'd like to thank again all of the people and the companies who made this course and this conference possible. Thanks to all of the awesome sponsors who actively choose to promote diversity as part of their mission. We truly couldn't have done this without you. Be sure to check our job board with lots of wonderful job opportunities. Thanks to Event Handler Productions for producing the event and for the team organizing the conference. Special thanks to Microsoft and the Baot community, which is the largest community in Israel for women in senior positions in R&D, for collaborating with us and to help us to turn our course into a dream come true. Special thanks to all of the course instructors, which are world-class speakers and true legends. And last but not least, to our brilliant and dedicated mentors who accompanied our students throughout the course. All right, so one last thing before we start, you're welcome to join our Slack channel for chat and Q&A with our speakers. The sessions are pre-recorded, so the speakers are going to be available during their talks to answer all of your questions live. We'd love to hear your thoughts. Ready? Here we go.
COVID-19 has created health, political, and global challenges. The pandemic forced the world leaders to cope with uncertainty and in many cases generated crises and tremendous losses for health, welfare, and economic systems. The coronavirus brought the world's leader to the center of the media stage, where they not only managed the COVID-19 pandemic, but also communicated it to the public. We all watch them almost every day and night through the television screen or through social media. How did the world leader communicate the guidelines to the public during the crisis? How did they motivate the public? And are there differences between the discourse of female and male leaders? These are the questions we will be discussing here today. I want to show you two videos. The first feature, Prime Minister Benjamin Netanyahu, and the second feature, Jacinda Ardern, New Zealand Prime Minister. Both are from March 2020, the beginning of the pandemic. Please, listen carefully. <laughs> אנחנו ממשיכים במערכה שלנו נגד נגיף הקורונה. אני מבקש לדווח לכם על שלוש פעולות נוספות שאנחנו נוקטים, ודבר אחד יסודי שאני מבקש מכם לעשות, אזרחי ישראל, שבלעדיו כל המאמצים שלנו לא יועילו. אנחנו ראינו מה קורה במדינות אחרות שלא נקטו את הצעדים הללו. אלפים בעולם כבר מתו, כראש הממשלה, אני חייב להגיד לכם את האמת. לשמחתי, עוד לא איבדנו אף אחד. אבל זה לא יימשך. אתם תשמעו תכף הערכות של משרד הבריאות על כמה קורבנות אנחנו יכולים לספוג אם לא נשנה את ההרגלים שלנו. וזו מגפה באמת קשה. זה לא משחק ילדים. זה לא חופש גדול, זה עניין של חיים או מוות. There is huge uncertainty out there right now, but one thing I am certain of, we are a nation that has been shaped because of our experiences and they often have been tough, harsh and unpredictable. That is when New Zealanders are at their best. That is when we rally, when we look after one another, when we care for the most vulnerable. So, Mr. Speaker, my final message is this to New Zealanders. Be strong, but be kind. We will be okay. Let's think about it. What strategy should the leader choose and what emotion should the leader provoke to persuade and motivate the public? Use of intimidation like Netanyahu did? Or send reassuring message, encourage the public as Jacinda Ardren did? Before we answer these questions, let's take a moment to talk about an interesting study conducted in the northeast of the United States and deal with, surprise, hand washing. The researchers were interested in finding out what can be done to make hospital staff to wash their hands? Hospital staff have everything they need to wash their hands. They also know that not implementing personal hygiene practices could cause infection and death, and still they didn't do it. The researcher decided to install surveillance cameras and inform the staff they would be under inspection. Do you think the surveillance help? Well, not at all. The next thing the research team did was to install an electronic screen in each room that gave staff members immediate feedback regarding their performance. Every time someone washed their hands, the screen showed rate of staff members who washed their hands. As well, positive feedback like, it's great shift, keep it up. You won't believe what happened. Hand washing went up from 10 to 90 percent. How did this happen? We can list four explanations for this finding. We know all of them from our everyday life. One, 
Positive strategy motivates people to act. Instead of using threats, the more accepted approach in these situations, the research team chose a positive and immediate strategy. They gave positive feedback. Brain research has found that when we accept positive feedback and positive outcomes, we will be more likely to perform the behavior. You can try this at home. Instead of telling your child, if you don't study for your test, you will fail, tell them, if you study, you will succeed. Two, negative strategy prevent action. According to brain researcher Tali Sharot, people tend to freeze in the face of unknown dangers. It's an instinct. So, of course, we won't be able to change our behavior when we are frightened. Three, it won't be happened to me. It's hard for us to imagine something terrible happened to us. This is why when we are told we might be harmed, it doesn't seem possible. Four, positive conformity. We want to be part of something great. If everyone wash their hands and the infection level decrease, we want to be part of this achievement. So, that's why leaders should say words of stability and hope, reassuring words, rather than scaring the public. When Jacinda says, be strong, be kind, everything will be okay, she manages to recruit the public in her country to comply with the guidelines. When she says the nation is capable to handling the crisis, she increases positive conformity. Furthermore, in a study conducted in Rotterdam University, which surveyed USA president rhetoric during economic crisis, they found that during time of crisis, a leader's language should not reflect fear. Progress, change, ideal, these are the words, promotion words, that leaders should use. Positive or negative framing, prevention or promotion words are only some of the verbal persuasion practices world leaders should use. There are many other persuasion strategies, such as ethos, the, leaders, the way leaders talk about themselves, pathos, the emotional component, logos, the rational one, storytelling, metaphors, and more. My college, Moran Yarchi, and myself were interested in whether there were differences in persuasion practices between male and female leaders during what is considered the first wave of the pandemic. In a study we are working on at the moment, we analyzed 30 speeches made by 10 leaders around the world, five men and five women. We have already found a number of results indicating differences between male and female leaders, some of which are quite surprising. The finding even seems to challenge previous communication patterns. So, what did we find? As the theoretical and analytical framework of gender communication suggests, female leaders ask more questions, tend to apologize slightly more than male leaders, and talk less about themselves. They tended to share successes and usually use the word we instead of I. According to this framework, male leaders talk more about themselves. They glorify actions and achievements comparing to the leader of other country, essentially saying, I'm doing a better job here. They also tend to use negative metaphors, often relating to war, like enemy, attack, fight, or victim. You can see here. The worst attack we've ever had on our country. This is really the worst attack we've ever had. This is worse than Pearl Harbor. This is worse than the World Trade Center. There's never been an attack like this. Nous sommes en guerre. We are in a situation of war. A health war. We're not fighting against any army or another nation, but the enemy is there. It's invisible and it's progressing. That requires our general mobilization. We are at war. 
And all the government's action and all the parliament's action has now got to turn towards the fight against this epidemic. In contrast to the framework of gender communication, and although male discourse is considered more rational, we found that male leaders use less rational explanations, less facts and arguments, and use more emotional appeals, but they use negative ones. Male leaders also tell more stories and give more examples, persuasion practice previously attributed to women. Male leaders tended more to intimidate and use prevention words and demagogic elements as Netanyahu states, it's a matter of life or death. But some of them also use more promotion words like Lee Hsien Long, Prime Minister of Singapore, encouraged and praised the citizens. In such a crisis, everyone has a part to play. I hope you'll work with me and my colleagues to keep our families safe, keep Singapore secure, and move forward together. Thank you. In contrast to the framework of gender communication, we found that female leaders use logical explanations, they give people facts and use clear arguments. In the past, like I mentioned, rational discourse was attributed to men more than women, but in recent years, and especially in the current crisis, female leaders have adopted rational and transparent discourse. Chai Ing Wen, the leader of Taiwan, wrote detailed daily update and refuted fake news. Angela Merkel, the Chancellor of Germany, explained to the public exactly how the curve is going to look. Natürlich auch nicht. Das kann ich immer nur für eine Infektionskette sagen, ob einer einen ansteckt. Das ist dann ein Mittelwert, aber es ist ungefähr einer steckt einen an. Schon wenn wir darauf kommen, dass jeder 1,1 Menschen ansteckt, dann sind wir im Oktober wieder an der Leistungsfähigkeit unseres äh, Gesundheitssystems mit den äh, angenommenen Intensivbetten. Wenn wir 1,2, also jeder steckt 20 Prozent mehr, 1,2 an, also von fünf Menschen steckt einer zwei an und vier ein, dann äh, kommen wir im Juli schon an die, an die Belastungsgrenze unseres Gesundheitssystems. Und bei Erna Solberg, Norway's Prime Minister, held press conferences for children in which she answered questions about the pandemic. Female leaders also tend to offer more solutions to problems, a finding that challenged the old pattern that suggests that women do not engage in practical discourse. Other study conducted by researchers from Israel found a significant difference between men and women leaders with regards to nonverbal communication behavior during the COVID-19 crisis. The researchers found that male leaders' nonverbal communication included competition, warning, threatening, and scaring behavior like finger-pointed gesture sharp movement and angry facial expression, while female leaders presented emotional communication, empathy, optimism, eye contact, and flexible expressions. Female leaders use round hand movements, extensive facial expressions, and expressive voice. Finally, female leaders may have adopted part of the male discourse, but they did it with empathy, relaxed appearance, style, and smile. All of these seem to be what helped them to manage the crisis better in their countries.
Hi, my name is Maital. I'm a software engineer writing code mostly in Python and C++. And I also volunteer at Cheat Codes as a Python mentor and track manager. I'd like to share my journey to discover the Python world or tell the story of why I stopped hating Python. That was me a few years back, studying chemistry at the Hebrew University of Jerusalem. Well, I did like to be exact. That's part of the reason that I switched to a discipline I find more exact, computer science, and it's probably why I really liked C when first encountering and programming in it. Each variable is declared clearly. You're the one responsible for the memory you allocate and use, and I have a special place in my heart for pointers. Also, most of the courses I chose to take as a student were ones that included writing in C and C++. Soon after graduating, I worked at a small startup company in which I helped design and implement an internal software that operates a system for calibrating water meters. Our code was written in C-sharp. The tests we ran on the system produced CSV files, which I initially had to manually analyze and visualize in Excel. After about two days manually creating graphs from data, which was in pretty much in the same format for each test, I realized that some automation was in order. I started Googling how to use c -sharp to create and update Excel files, and it seemed that everything I found was either complicated or an overkill. So I thought, why not give Python a try? I first encountered Python when I had to take a programming course at the mandatory part of my chemistry degree, the one I ditched out on. Later on, studying computer science, I took one course where we actually studied Python and a couple more in which we wrote some small Python scripts. My first impression on Python was that developers see it as inferior. There's some negative prejudice towards Python that it's too easy or less professional, since you don't have to deal with all of the important stuff we learn to pay attention to, like memory allocation, passing the right pointer or reference, and defining and choosing the right types we'd like to use, etc. Speaking about types, Python is dynamically typed, which I used to think is really confusing and, well, not precise and clear as other languages. Let's get back to our story. It took me about half a day to get it running, from installing Python to preparing the script and testing it without actually being familiar with Python as I was with c in which I was coding for a couple of months at the time. At that point, I realized that Python can and should be another great tool in my toolbox. Here's why I think it should be in yours too. For me, choosing to write in Python held a bit of confusion, some mental aspect of choosing a tool which to me at first also might have looked as inferior. We programmers like to work hard sometimes. Does our ego prevent us from using a great tool? But what are we gaining from choosing such a tool? First, acquiring it is done very fast especially if you're already familiar with another programming languages. You could start implement and code very quickly, as I did in the previous example. This is also true if you're new to programming, since Python was designed to be fun to use and to be read and written as similar as possible to English. For example, let's compare this line of code with this one. Both code snippets check whether word starts with prefix. I think we all agree that the second one is much more readable and it took less time to understand. And well, readability counts is one of Python's mottos and it wasn't chosen in coincidence. I'd like to quote a phrase from a book I recently read, A Mind for Numbers, written by Professor Barbara Oakley. It is used to be thought that a walking memory could hold around seven items or chunks but it's now widely believed that the working memory holds only about four chunks of information. You can think of a working memory as a RAM or a blackboard for sketching, processing, and creating new ideas. We don't want to exhaust it. Python's higher ability allows us, amongst other things I will mention later on, to focus on what truly matters when we design and implement our product or feature. It keeps our working memory clear from distractions so we can concentrate on the algorithm, algorithm itself and not waste energy on questions like, hmm, which type should I declare this variable? 
that this number needs casting. Um, don't forget to free allocation when done with this variable, and so on. I'm not saying that the types you're using or the memory consumption doesn't need to concern you. I'm just saying it doesn't need to concern you all the time. Another aspect is the flexibility allowed by Python being dynamically typed. It allows better polymorphism and makes their use of code easier. For example, if a function operates on an argument that has a field called whatever, you can send any type that has such a field to this function. It also makes the code shorter, no need for type declaration, less code to write and read, which leads me to the next advantage. This is a simple example of the famous hello world in Python versus C. Can you see where I'm going with this? But if we want to be more formal, let's talk about Rosetta code. Rosetta code is a programming Christomathy site that gathers different implementation to the same tasks in as many different languages as possible. It contains solutions to known problems such as the N queen problem, towers of Hanoi, or calculating the greatest common divisor. It was used as a code base for a comparative study that amongst other questions, tried to, to answer the question, which programming languages make for more concise code? To answer this, they measured the non-black lines of code, removing comment lines and considering only code that ran without errors. These were the results. We can see that on average, the length of the coding solutions written in Python was only about a third of the length in other languages such as C or Java. Not to mention C sharp. Guess it was a good idea to choose Python for these CSV files. Overall, they found that languages that are considered functional or scripting languages provide significantly more concise code and concise and readable code makes it maintainable. In addition, multiple earlier studies show that bug density across programming languages is largely constant. This means that less code means less option for errors and less bugs. Also, less code means it will be easier to trace those bugs and then fix them. The next point I'd like to talk about is that not all tasks are created equal. If you're writing a embedded system in which real-time performance is a critical issue, I won't say Python should be your main developing language, but it might help you with testing or prototyping and POCing, or as it works for me, analyzing the data you collect. And sometimes another approach will do. If you like one and you like the other, why not adapting both? C Python implementation, which is Python's most commonly used reference implementation, supports extending Python with C or C++. But there are also modules customized for all Python implementations, such as C types or CFFI. So you can combine the best of the two worlds. And finally, we can look uh, over the last few years. Python's getting more and more popular. On GitHub, it is ranked the second most popular programming language. And on TOB, which is the index based on multiple popular search engines, it made the highest jump in popularity in 2020 placing it the third most popular worldwide. So let's summarize the reasons that made me love Python. First, it's quick learning curve that helped me get right into coding a simple and quick solution and saved me a lot of time. Second, readability, which makes the code we write less messy and allows us to focus. Remember those four chunks of memory, memory we mentioned earlier? Third, maintainability. Readable code is maintainable. Another developer looking at your code or yourself six months from now will understand what you meant more easily. We also spoke about Python's flexibility in being dynamically typed and how it supports polymorphism and helps us reuse of existing code, keeping our code shorter. And we saw the results of a study on Rosetta code that showed that Python is a super concise language and less code means less bugs and easier debugging. We wrapped up with noting that tasks aren't created equal. You should be able to pick the right tool for the right task and Python might be a great choice. You can also pick more than one tool to solve a problem. 
So I'd like to summarize all by saying that you should ditch the prejudice and biases. Try something new. You might discover a great tool or technique that will help you solve your next challenge. Thank you. If you'd like to reach out, this is how you can do it. And I'd like to say a special thanks for the people who made this talk possible.
Hello everyone, my name is Yerde, and today I will talk to you about file systems and how we can hide data in them. I'm a digital forensic researcher at Selva, and as such, I'm constantly looking for places that can provide me with information, mostly about the recent activity that happened on a computer. So, let's play a game that demonstrates my day-to-day -day challenges. There are some hidden details in these pictures. Can you spot them? There are many details in our file system that can hide in plain sight and can give us a lot of meaningful information. That is a good example for what I am about to talk to you today. We will talk about file systems. We will get to know a specific feature that provides us the ability to hide data and makes this data hard for others to find. To achieve this, we will begin by explaining what a file system is, how does it work. We will dive into NTFS specific implementation, and finally, we will see how this feature is meant to be used and how it can be abused. File system is an organizational structure. The file system manages data created by processes and for them. Actually, the file system divides the media device, such as hard disk, into logical units of data that can be read later. Those, those logical units are known as files. To keep the structure, we will usually see the use of directories that are basically just like files. They have most, if not all, of the properties that files have. What can be done using files? We know we can create, delete, read and write files. We also know that files have properties like name, size, and creation time. To use this information, file system needs to save this data. There are many file system implementations. One of the most popular implementations is Microsoft file system called NTFS, or New Technology File System. As I mentioned before, file system needs to save this property, also known as metadata. We will see the implementation in NTFS. In NTFS, this is implemented as a table called master file table. Each file is represented by a master file table. This structure contains all the attributes of the file, such as size, creation, time, and many more. The attribute that interests us is the data attribute because the data attributes contain the default data of the file. From now, we will address it as the default data stream. Let's see an example. I have this very important picture on my computer. As I mentioned before, the attribute which contains the content of the file is the data attribute. Now that we know how this attribute is called, let's try to access this beautiful picture via the data attribute. Great, we got it. If we look closely, we will notice that we have two columns here. What if I write something else between them? For example, I will try to open a picture by entering a different name between these columns. We got the picture. Let's explain what happened. I wrote the string secret between those columns and got an additional data. Why is that? Remember that I referred to the file data as default data stream? This is the reason. In NTFS, a file can have multiple data attributes that associate with a file. The default data stream the one we can see when we open a file using any program is the unnamed stream. The other streams called alternate data streams. Alternate data stream, as the name suggests, is an additional data attribute that can contain the same kind of information as the default stream. We can add an alternate stream to files, directories, and also drives. 
the picture that we are seeing here is a picture that I entered into named string called secret. There are a number of tools that can display this data, for example. We can check if an alternate stream exists by using the dir slash r command. We can use the more utility to see the content of the named string. Why was this feature created? Alternate data stream was originally created for supporting Mac users and allowing them to use NTFS based file servers. So they would, would not lose data saved in HFS, the file system used by Mac. Most of us have some alternate data streams on our computers. NTFS file system itself uses it to save some journaling information, like logs about deletion, creation, change, and more. Another common use of alternate data stream is the security zone. When we download a file, internet browser generates security zone data that indicates the level of trust for the URL. This data is usually saved in alternate data stream called zone identifier. According to the security zone, the system decides if the file is safe or not. When we download an executable, the security zone will cause a security warning. For instance, Chrome browser saved the security zone and the URL from which the file was downloaded from. In forensics perspective, this can provide us an insight about how the file was downloaded and from where. How could this be misused? This is a stream that is not easy to see, but it is user accessible, so it is a very good place to hide data. Whether the data is a personal, informative, or malicious. For example, I added a large amount of data to an innocent file, and the file size was not affected. Now we will see some different kinds of malicious use. I will now introduce some methods in which malware use alternate data stream to perform. Denial of service is an attack that prevents users from using the system by crashing it or making it inaccessible. The attackers fill the hard drive with data in alternate data stream, so it fills up all the available space on the system. This prevents the system from working properly. Another kind of denial of service is to create many alternate data streams on a single file and then access this file. That makes the system work slowly or even crash. This is a good method to use because it is hard to detect. Another example is an issue affecting Microsoft Web Server platform. The vulnerability gave users the ability to view source code files that was only meant to be executed. Due to a parsing issue, the user could have read the file's content directly from the default data stream. Alternate data stream can also be used for inserting malicious code or even entire road virtual computer into a network. There are other techniques that can be take advantage of the still nature of alternate data stream. Microsoft addresses some of the malicious uses of alternate data stream such as the ability to run an executable hiding inside an alternate data stream directly from the start command. But there are still vulnerabilities in this area. It is important to note that alternate data stream is a well-known feature, and there are many antiviruses that know how to handle it. But because it is accessible but not easy to detect, this is still a problematic feature that attackers can abuse. My goal in this talk was to introduce alternate data stream feature and to show that with some cre creative thinking and deep technical knowledge, you can find interesting things in everyday systems that may seem plain and naive. I hope you enjoyed my talk. Thank you very much.
Hi. I love drinking coffee first thing in the morning. This is my small comforting ritual. What is the first thing you do in the morning? Do you ever start your day by opening your computer to start spark long running job before you have had coffee? If you use Spark jobs, you probably work with lots of data, which is exactly what Spark good at. Apache Spark is a unified analytics engine for large scale data processing. After this talk, you'll have time for a leisurely cup of coffee every morning. Although Spark code is easy to write and read, it doesn't mean that users don't run into issues of long running, slow performing jobs. With just a few lines of code, you can get hundreds or thousands of machines immediately working. Which brings me to the second problem, the cost. We will talk how to get the most out of your Spark clusters. By leveraging Spark abilities, it is not uncommon to see the same job running 10 or 100 times faster with the same cluster and the same data. We will take a deeper look on how Spark works under the hood. Spark was designed with an optimizer called Catalyst. The Catalyst optimizer improves the performance of queries by applying rules and evaluating several execution plans. In addition, it allows the Spark community to implement and extend the optimizer with new features. We will put theory into practice by looking into few out of many Spark optimizations and see how the fact that we use UDF influences the performance of Spark. We will compare performance of queries that use Spark functions and queries that use UDFs. User-defined function is a feature of Spark SQL which allows you to extend Spark by adding custom constructs simply by writing your own logic. UDFs come with significant performance overhead compared to Spark native functions because Spark doesn't know how to optimize UDFs. Spark utilizes the concept of predicate pushdown to optimize your execution plan. The idea of it is that data is being filtered on disk and as a result, only the relevant data is brought to memory, which saves you IO and networking. For example, if you specify a filter that only requires to fetch few rows from the data source, the most efficient way to execute this is to access only what, what is needed. Spark will actually optimize this for you by pushing the filter down automatically. In this example, I've ordered the data by the timestamp field and implemented the queries, two queries to filter the data. The first where I use Spark built-in function to get rows with timestamp greater than some value. The second query does exactly the same, only I wrapped the logic inside an UDF and use the UDF for filtering. From the physical plan that Spark generated, you can see how Spark will execute the query. First, it will scan the data on disk and fetch it to memory. Then, Spark will filter the data in memory. Spark functions query, as you can see in this table, run almost six times faster than UDF query. The reason to that is that Spark reads twice times more data when using UDFs. When using UDF, Spark is not able to push down the filters as it doesn't know the internal logic of the UDF 
Thus, it has to read the whole data into memory and do the logic in memory. This is the reason that the UDF query ra runs much slower. Here are the pushed filters from the physical plane. You can see the not null uh, standard filters that Spark adds. But in the Spark functions physical plane, we also find additional filter uh, greater than, which gives us a clue about the logic that Spark will apply to the data on disk, filtering only the relevant uh, rows. In this example, I've partitioned the data by country. And as previously, use Spark function to implement logic that filters USA country. And the same logic uh, wrapped in UDF. In the stage results, you can see that Spark functions query runs six times faster than UDF query. The reason to that is the amount of data Spark reads. With Spark function, Spark reads only the relevant partition, while with UDF it has to read all the data and do the filtering in memory. And again, this makes Spark functions much faster. In the partition filters of the physical plans, we find the is not null filters. But in the partition filters of Spark functions, we also find a specific country filter. And as you remember, we partitioned our data by country. Thus, Spark will be able to grab the whole partition without the need to scan the disk or doing additional logic. Constant folding is another optimization that Spark does. Spark recognizing and evaluating constant expressions at compile time rather than computing them at runtime. This is not specific to Catalyst, but it's just standard compilation technique and it benefit should be obvious. It is better to compute expression once and use the result for each row. In this query, I use two fields, start timestamp and end timestamp, in order to filter the data. I wanted to get all the rows that the difference between the end time and start time is less, less than 24 hours. The timestamps fields were given in milliseconds. Uh, the equation uh, speaks for itself. The div should be smaller than the amount of milliseconds in 24 hours, which is 24 multiplied by 60 minutes, multiplied by 60 seconds, multiplied by 1000 milliseconds. The very same logic implemented as UDF. And you can see the physical plan. Here, here all of the filtering done in memory. I wanted to isolate this optimization, so I prevented Spark from optimizing the disk filters. Although Spark reads the same amount of data from disk, you can see that Spark functions are five times faster than UDFs. We see that processing time of Spark function is much more efficient than of UDFs. Uh, as we said, the optimization happens in memory. From taking a look at the data filters part of the physical plans, we find the standard not null filters that Spark adds. In the physical plan of UDFs, we also can find an obscure filter that doesn't add too much information. 
But in Spark function plan, we see the logic of our filter with pre-calculated number that equals to the value from the query. Spark substituted the final number by constant value, which he applied in runtime instead of calculating it on each and every row as UDF query had to do. Let's summarize what we learned here. If possible, not use UDFs, you better not to. The reason is that Spark cannot optimize the plans uh, when you use UDFs. And as we saw, it can have huge performance cost. Another thing is when you, your data is partitioned and sorted by the key you use for filtering, this helps Spark to read the relevant data more efficiently. And last thing, uh, when possible, use Parquet file, files to store the data. It has few benefits. First, Parquet has schema, which works well with the push down concepts that we talked earlier. Secondly, there are additional optimizations that Spark can apply uh, on Parquet files such as column proning, which allows uh, more optimization by reading only the relevant columns. Spark is a huge platform to study, and it has a myriad of nuts and bolts which, which can optimize your jobs. We covered only few of those nuts and bolts, and there is still a lot to be explored. But before, Let's take a moment to sit back, relax, and have your coffee. Thank you for listening. If you have any questions, I'm here to answer. And you can reach out by email or contact me on LinkedIn.
Hi everyone, my name is Nitsan and this session is about designing a data structure that will address your business needs. Today we are going to talk about why do we need to plan a data structure up front, but most importantly, how are we going to do that? I'm going to present three stages for designing a data structures and in the end to present some tips on how you can test yourself and make sure that the data structures are correct. Just before we start, let me give a brief introduction of myself. So my name is Nitsan, I'm a business intelligence engineer and I work for Amazon. I'm currently based in the UK. I have slightly more than six years of experience. I own a BSc from Ben Gurion University and I live with my spouse, my son Carmel and my dog Malka. So why do we need to design a data structure upfront? Each data product goes through these following stages. The first one is the design, which we are going to cover today. The second one is the ETL, the Extract, Transform and Load, meaning taking raw data, taking it from a data pipeline until we get to uh, aggregated tables. These aggregated tables are the tables that we need in order to show the information that fits the business requirements. After taking these uh, aggregated data tables, we create a front-end. That can be either a report, a tool, or just the product itself that shows the users um, the data that it needs. So the problem is that if the design is incorrect, everything will be incorrect, and eventually the end product won't show the right data and what fit the requirement that we've set up front. Unfortunately, I'm talking from experience. I've learned it the hard way when in the previous company that I worked for, I designed a data structure that was missing a fundamental dimension and as a result, I needed to start everything from the beginning. As I mentioned earlier, in order to make sure that won't happen to you, in the end, I will present some ideas on how to check your uh, tables. So what are the steps for designing a data structure? The first thing that we need to do is identify what is the business question. Let's assume that we are launching a new product and we want to measure the user engagement in this product. In details, we want to make sure that we understand what are the daily new users, the daily active users, the monthly active users, the conversion rate, and the average engagement time. Sometimes these requirements won't be so clear as you see now. They may come across a bit vague and it's important to make sure that we have really clear, clear requirements before we continue. Besides the requirements themselves, it's really important to understand the different definitions. For example, what is an active user? Is it a user who has an account? Is, a, is it a user who did an action? A conversion rate, for example. Conversion rate can be a user who finished onboarding, a user who clicked, a user who did a purchase, and so on. The different definition may vary from company to company, from product to product, and even different people in the same company who works in the same product may have different perspective. It's really important to make sure that we have clear requirements and clear definitions up front with the people that we work with. After we've identified the business question, the next stage will be to understand what are the dimensions, facts, and attributes. Let's start with facts. Facts are the measurements, basically the metrics. What are, what are we really testing? In this case, we test how many users, meaning counting the users. We are also looking for the conversion rate, meaning what is the total views versus the total conversion. The third thing that we are looking for is the average engagement time, meaning the total engagement time versus the number of engagement. After we've identified the facts, we will look for the different dimensions. Dimensions are the way that the data is sliced. In our case, we are looking for daily data. That means that date needs to be a dimension because we need to understand what happens in each, in each single day. If we want to measure the engagement by other factors, for example, by country, we'll add the country as a dimension. We can add different dimensions depending, depending on the business needs. For example, if we want to understand if the engagement is varied by different operating system, we'll add the OS as a third dimension. We can also add dimensions like gender 
if we want to understand if there is a difference between the conversions, the engagement, etc., of men and women. Besides dimension, we'll need to identify our attributes. Attributes are additional information which does not affect the level of granularity. In other words, these are columns that are higher in the hierarchy. So if we know what is the country, we also know what is the region. If we know what is the OS, we also know if the user has logged in from a mobile or from a desktop. And if we know the date, we clearly know what is the month, the quarter, the year, etc. After we've identified these three components, dimensions, facts, and attributes, we'll move, move on to the third stage, which is planning the tables themselves. In order to plan the tables, we'll use a method that is called star schema. In a star schema, the tables are linked together in the shape of a star. In the middle, we have the fact table that contains all of our dimensions and the facts. And this table is linked to dimensions table that will contain additional information of every dimension. For example, not just the ID, but also the name. And it will contain the different attributes that are relevant for the dimensions. Let's look at how it looks in our case. So in our case, the fact table is an engagement table that we contain these four dimensions, date, country, OS, and gender. This dimension will function as the keys of the table. That means that there will be no more than a single combination of the date, a country, an OS, and a gender. This is in order to maintain the level of granularity that we've predefined. Besides these dimensions, we also hold the fact in this fact table. So based on the business question and the dimensions that, and facts that we've identified, we also have uh, active users, new users. In order to measure the conversion rate, we will save the number of views and number of conversions. And in order to measure the engagement type in average, we'll save the total engagement type and the number of engagements. It's really important not to measure the ratio, uh, meaning the percentages and saving the total and the number in order to be able to aggregate in different levels of granularity. This engagement table is linked to different dimension table. For example, the first one, dimension country, we have the country code. And in this uh, table, we also have the country name and we have the attribute region because if we know the country, we know the region. We have an OS table that holds the OS ID and the OS name. And based on these two, we can define the attribute device type. We also have a date table that holds the date. And since we know the date, we know the month, the quarter, and the year. So it looks like we have finished and we have a schema, which is great. Now, how do we make sure that we got it right? The best way to do that is look back at the business questions and try to answer them by using the tables that we've created. Let's take an example. What was the conversion rate in January 2021 for females who logged in from mobile devices from Israel? Let's query the schema that we've created and see if it answers the business question. We'll select the number of conversion divided by number of views and get the conversion rate. This is the fact that we've created. We'll use the fact table engagement joined by two dimension table, the OS table and the date table. And from this table, we will uh, select the relevant dimensions. We'll select the months, the year, the gender, the device type, and the country. So according to this query, looks like we got it right and we can answer the business question by using the tables that we've created. If we we'll continue this exercise and do the same thing for all of the business question by using different combinations of dimensions and attributes, we'll be able to make sure that we got it right and we have a, a schema that works and basically addresses the business question. So to summarize, we talked today about why we need to plan a data structure upfront. This is in order to make sure that eventually the end product answers the business question after the ETL phase and the front end phase. How do we do that? First of all, is identifying the business questions and make sure that we understand all of the definition and everything is super clear. The second thing is what are the dimensions, facts, and attributes. And the third thing is planning the tables by using a star schema.
In the end, after we finalized a, a table and a design, we'll verify the design by querying the tables that we've, creating, that we've created and make sure that they answer the business questions. Thank you very much for listening in. This is my LinkedIn profile and you are happy to connect. Thanks again.
Hello everyone, my name is Maria. I'm a bioinformatician and a data scientist at day two. Today, I will talk about how graph theory can help us know more about you from your poo. But first, let me tell you about myself. I live in Tel Aviv. I have two cats that hate the fact I'm home this much. And in my free time, when there are no global epidemics, I love running and traveling. So, why do I want to know what's in your poo? Well, just a hobby of mine. No, I'm kidding. Let me explain. Did you know? The human microbiome is highly personalized. Different people have radically different collections of microbes. We can find microbiome on the skin, hair, vagina, nostrils, and many other locations. But 95% of our microbiota is located in our digestive tract. We have at least 1.3 to 1 bacteria cells to human cells, and even more fungi, archaea, and virus cells in our body. We are outnumbered. A rough estimation is that we have 2 million different bacteria genes in our gut, which is 100 times more than the estimated 2,000 human genes. Knowing all this, the connection to human health should not surprise you. Although we do not fully understand how the variation between different people influence wellness, our understanding of the link between the human microbiome and disease is rapidly expanding. In metabolic disease, such as obesity and type 2 diabetes, human genetics has failed to explain its tendency. In contrast, we can classify individuals as lean or obese using the gut microbiome with over 90% accuracy. In inflammatory bowel disease patients and children at risk for type 1 diabetes, we can notice altered microbiome composition especially loss of diversity, which means those people have less species of microbes in their gut. Other conditions like C. diff infection, cancer, and autism show that improvement of symptoms or a better response to chemotherapy after microbiome treatment. Many other conditions have links to the microbiome. Part of them is yet to be discovered. Speaking of microbiome-based treatments, a great example is the fecal microbiota transplant. It is basically when a doctor transplants feces from a healthy donor with a golden poo into another person to restore the balance of bacteria in their gut. So, what can I, as a data scientist, do with this data? The main motivation is to build predictive machine learning models for different health conditions. Once we can predict them, hopefully we can also prevent them. Finding connections and correlation can use for diagnosis, and the ability to define a good microbiome profile can contribute to treatment, like in the example of fecal microbiota transplant. For those models, I need features. What kind of features can I extract from the microbiome? We can learn a lot by knowing how much of each organism we have in our gut. Diversity levels, as I said before, can be a good indication of several conditions. The relationship patterns between organisms are critical. We also can search for different genes that lead for different functions. Mutation existence can help us understand the smallest variation in phenotypes, and we can build clusters using microbiome profiles. Now that I convinced you why I do need this data, how can I get it? It all starts from stool sample, which gives us a snapshot of the microbiome's current state. Now, we want to discover the organisms in the sample. To do so, we need to extract their genomes. What is a genome, anyway? It's a very long string made of millions of characters of the alphabet ATCG. To get these genomes, we usually use a sequencing machine. Its input is a sample, and the output is the genomes of all the organisms inside the sample. One of the problems with this technology is that the machine must break the genomes into small pieces to read them correctly. So, we get lots of mixed short strings, and we need to identify them by mapping the output to massive databases of known macros. Now, we can get all our genomes, but wait, there is a problem. Some of those reads do not map to anything we know, and we will not be able to identify them. Why couldn't we map those reads to anything? It happens when it's hard to grow the organism in lab conditions. 
In other cases, it happens when the organism is novel, rare, or even really small. Sometimes a known organism going through a mutation process, and now it will be harder for us to recognize it. So what will we do? We need to build new genomes. The solution emerged from an unexpected origin. Some of you may recognize it from algorithms course as the seven bridges of Konigsberg. Konigsberg residents enjoy strolling through their city and they wondered if every part of the city could be visited by walking across each of the seven bridges exactly once and returning to the starting point. Otto solved this question by representing each part of the city by a node and each bridge as an edge. Otto Circle is a trail in infinite graph that visits every edge exactly once and starts and ends on the same vertex. He proved that a necessary condition for Eulerian Circle existence is that all vertex in the directed connected graph have the same in degree and out degree. Nicolas de Bruyne adapted Euler's idea and formed the De Bruyne graph for solving the superstring problem. In this problem, given a set of n strings, you need to find the smallest string that contains all the substrings in the set. In our days, we use those two algorithms for our problem, the genome assembly. The genomic assembly is a computational process of drawing together numerous mixed short strings and organize them together in the correct order to assembly a full genome, just like the Bruyne's problem, but with genomic strings. Let me show you how to build a De Bruyne graph for a genome. Let's imagine we have lots of short strings like this one. Now, pick a K and split your strings into overlapping k-mers. In this case, I picked cake equals string. Now we get GGG, GGC, and the rest. Now, take each trimmer and split it into two overlapping substrings of length k-1. In our example, each substring contains two characters. GGGG, GGGC, and you got a point. Now let's draw a node for each pair and a directed edge from each left substring to its right substring. You can see here the GG node with an edge to itself. GG connects to GC gc to cc, and the same for the rest. With perfect sequencing, this procedure always yields an Eulerian graph. You can see that in this graph, the first and the last nodes are semi-balanced, and all other nodes are balanced, meaning they have the same in degree and out degree. Now we can reconstruct our sequence using the Eulerian walk from the graph. You can try it yourself. In the real problem, you do the same procedure on millions of short strings and combine them all together using overlapping nodes to a huge Eulerian graph. But there are still some challenges using the Bruyne graph for genome assembly. Sequence errors, repetitive sections, and computational cost are a few of the leading challenges that makes it very hard to reconstruct some of the genomes. For example, in this case, it is impossible to know which one is the correct path? Is it the first option, which goes through the upper loop first? Or the second one, that goes through the lower loop first? Usually, the best option is to split the graph into two partial genomes. You can see here another example. This graph can occur when there are repetitive areas that creates a bubble in the graph. Two paths are possible. The one that goes up and the one that goes down. In this case, we have a hard time deciding which one is the correct one and we will have to split it once again. Before we finish, I want to give you a little example from the Segata Lab, a large research group. They did an amazing job they collected samples from all around the world and built using genome assembly pipeline 150 thousands of new genomes. Most of those organisms were never described before. What if one of them is the key to prevent the next disease or epidemic? If you want to talk more about microbiome, the brain graphs, or cats, please contact me on Gmail or LinkedIn. Thank you.
If you know me, you probably know that I have a lot of classification problems. Some in my personal life, but mostly at work. I started from just running a list of classifiers, and while some work better in some cases, and others are better for other cases, XGBoost consistently performs very good. I was really excited to see that, because XGBoost is a tree-based model, and I really like trees. In nature, of course, but also in machine learning. They're really easy to understand, you know? The kind of machine learning model you can tell your mom about. So I wanted to understand how XGBoost works and why it performs so well. My name is Yama Nina Minov, and I'm a data scientist and a musician. I work at MyPart, a startup in the music industry. Today, I'm going to share with you my journey with tree-based classifiers while tackling the problem of classifying songs into different genres. The first thing we're going to talk about is the dataset and the process of extracting features from songs. Then we're going to see how to build a decision tree and how it performs in this case of genre classification. Then we'll dive into XGBoost and see how it improved our results. And we'll finish with a comparison to other machine learning models. There are many ways to build a dataset for the problem of genre classification. The dataset we will see today is from Kaggle. We have four genres, pop, metal, blues, and classical music, with 100 samples from each genre. The features were extracted using Librosa, which is a Python package used for music and audio analysis. The features we're using are rhythm features and spectral features, which are features that are based on the frequency of the signal. Rhythm features include the estimated tempo, which is the speed of the song. That can be extracted from a tempogram. On the y-axis, we have the BPM, beats per minute, which is the way we measure tempo. The x-axis is the time. And here we can see how the tempi, which is the plural of tempo, changes over time. Spectral features include the spectral centroid, which is the weighted mean of the frequencies in the signal, with the magnitudes as the weights. For some of you, it might make sense to think about it as the center of mass of the spectrum. So how do we get those frequencies and magnitudes? We have a very nice function called Fourier transform that extracts the frequencies from a given signal. Of course, there's a lot more to get into all of this, but for today, that will do. So now that we have the features and the classes sorted, let's talk about decision trees. A decision tree asks questions and then separates the data by the answers. For example, if we want to build a decision tree for a binary classification between metal songs and non-metal songs, we can ask if the song is very loud. And since most metal songs are loud, we'll have more metal songs on the left and more non-metal songs on the right. But metal songs are more than just loud. And we can also ask questions that their answers are not binary. For example, if we want to ask something about how fast the song is, we can use the BPM we mentioned earlier, beats per minute, and we can ask if the song's BPM is larger than 100. And since most metal songs are faster than that, that should give us better separation between the classes. The first split is called the root node of the tree. Other splits are called nodes. And the final classification is coming from the leaf nodes, where we see the classes metal and not metal. So at each point, we want to find the best split for the tree. What does it mean the best? The one with the lowest impurity. A leaf is called pure if the samples that reach it are all from the same class. For example, if we look at all the songs that are not loud, we have 10 metal songs and 19 non-metal songs. So the probability of a song that reaches that leaf to be a metal song is 0.1. And the probability of a song that reaches that leaf to not be a metal song is 0.9. We can add these probabilities to every leaf node. And we can see that only one leaf classifying songs as not metal is pure, which means that in our data set, all songs that are loud and slow are not metal songs. While the two other leaves are impure, since they consist of both metal and non-metal songs. There are many ways to measure impurity, 
a common one is called Gini. In classification problems, the Gini impurity of a leaf is calculated using the probabilities of sample that reach that leaf being in class. In our case, the Gini impurity of a leaf is one minus the probability of being a metal song squared minus the probability of not being a metal song squared. So we can calculate the Gini impurity for each leaf node. Trust me, I've calculated it for you. These are the numbers we get. The next stage is to calculate the Gini impurity for using a specific feature and a specific threshold for the speed. And this is equal to the weighted average of the leaf node impurities. The weights are the ratio of song in each leaf, so that if one leaf consists of more songs, it will get more weight. So if the leaves under the BPM split consist of the same number of songs, the Guinea impurity for using the feature BPM and the threshold 100 is 0 0.21. And if we calculate the Guinea impurity for a split with the same feature BPM, but a different threshold, 70, we'll see that the leaves will be less pure and the Guinea impurity of that split will be higher. So we should choose the threshold 100 over the threshold 70. So for every split we want to add, we just have to go through all of the options for the splits, calculate the Guinea impurity, and choose the best one. If we have a binary feature or a categorical one, it's easy to go through all of the options. But if we have a numeric one, it sounds a bit confusing because we can't go over all of the numbers. One thing we can do is order all the values in the, this feature, calculate the average between each two values, and use those averages as the potential values for splits. So now that we know how to build a decision tree, let's see how it performs on our classification problem. Remember that it's classifying sounds into four genres and not just metal. So we get 81% accuracy, which is very nice, but can we do better than that? Since I love trees so much, I went through some more tree-based classifiers like Random Forest and Adaboost that improved the results, but not as much as XGBoost. XGBoost means extreme gradient boosting. Boosting is an ensemble method that helps reduce bias and variance. It converts weak learners, which are models that are just better than random guessing, like decision trees, to strong ones, which are models that are much better than, than random guessing, like XGBoost. If we're doing a binary classification, trying to predict if a song is metal or not. The values of the labels are one for metal songs and zero for non-metal songs. Of course, we have more features and more songs than what we see in this table. Xtipo starts by giving one initial prediction for all of the samples, the same prediction, and its default value is 0.5. So the default prediction is that there is a 50% chance that the song is a metal song. Then we calculate the residuals, the difference between the labels and the predictions. So for metal songs, we get 1 minus 0 0.5, which is 0 0.5. And for non-metal songs, we get 0 minus 0 0.5, which is minus 0 0.5. And we call them our new labels. And then we build the first tree. That tree tries to predict the new labels. How do we predict the labels if the numbers are not classes like we saw before? If we split by loudness, we look at all the songs that are not loud. And the prediction we put in the right leaf is the average label of these songs. In this case, it's one song and its label is minus 0.5. Then when we split by BPM, again, we get on the right leaf one song that its label is minus 0.5. On the left leaf, we get two metal songs and one non-metal song. So the prediction is the average of 0 0.5, 0 0.5, and minus 0 0.5, which is 0 0.167. And just like we saw in the decision tree, we have a measure that helps us choose the best split. This time, it's trying to minimize the residuals, the difference between the label and the prediction that results from each split. So when we want to use that tree for prediction, we add its prediction to the initial prediction. 
So if a song is fast and loud, its prediction will be 0 0.5 plus 0 0.167, which is 0 0.667. And this, that is the general concept. Every time we calculate the new residuals, which are the labels minus the predictions, and build a new tree that tries to predict those residuals. And for prediction, we add the initial prediction to the prediction of each one of the following trees. Each tree gets us a little bit closer to the real value. So actually, we're not just adding all of these predictions as they are, but also scaling them by a learning rate, which is a parameter called eta, and its default value is 0 0.3. So what is the learning rate and why do we need it? We said that each tree takes us one step closer to the real value. The learning rate says what is the size of the step we're taking. The smaller the step is, the closer we can get to the best model, but it's slower computationally because we have to take a lot of steps. For example, if there's ice cream one meter and 43 centimeters away from me and my step size is one meter long, the closest I can get to the ice cream is 43 centimeters away after taking one step. But if my step size is 10 centimeters long, I can take 14 steps and get three centimeters away from the ice cream. And of course, if my step size is one centimeter long, then I can get exactly to where the ice cream is and eat all of it. Just like in life, we can improve tremendously by taking a lot of small steps towards our goals. And it's not just inspirational, it results in lower vari variance, so we'll perform better on different datasets. The last object I'm going to talk about regarding Exibus is pruning. Pruning is the process of deleting splits from the tree. Doing that helps us reduce the complexity of the tree, improve accuracy, and reduce overfitting. In Exibus, after we finish building each tree, we move to the stage of pruning that tree. When we built the tree, we calculated the gain, which is sort of similar to the gain we mentioned in the decision tree, that helped us pick the best feature and threshold for each split. Now we use the gain to decide if we're keeping that split or pruning it. We choose a threshold, and if the gain is below that threshold, we prune the split, else we keep it. If we prune a split, then we will go backwards up the branch and test the split above it as well. It's possible to have a split with a smaller gain as a parent of a split with a higher gain. And that's what's nice about pruning after the tree is completely built. We won't miss that lower split with the higher gain, even though its parent has lower gain. So we talked about the initial prediction Xribus gives, the trees that predict the residuals, scaling the predictions by the learning rate, and pruning the trees after they are built. Of course, there's a lot more to say about XGBoost, regularization and optimizations, but for now, let's talk about performance. I ran XGBoost on my dataset of genre classification and got the amazing improvement of 92% accuracy, much better. Remember the two features I mentioned in the beginning, tempo and spectral centroid? When I looked at the feature importance of these two models, I noticed the decision tree didn't use them at all while well, XGBoost used all of the features. So just a few points of comparison between tree-based models and other models. One good point to start with is interpretability, since it's such a hot topic. Tree-based models are easier to interpret than many other models. Shep, for example, which is the library used to explain individual predictions, has a specific solution for tree-based models, which is faster and more accurate than the solution for other models. Also, it's easy to get feature importance from tree-based models, and sometimes not so easy from other models. Another subject that is a sore spot for many people in the industry is the amount of data needed. Tree-based models require less framing data than your networks, for example. And lastly, to make sure you don't think tree-based models are perfect, they only work on tabular data. So we can't use it for other data types like image, text, or audio. Now we can all go back to running XGBoost and enjoying the good results when we understand a bit better how it works. You're welcome to contact me on LinkedIn and thank you for listening.
Hi everyone! My name is Victoria Kalmanovich. I'm a software engineering manager at Aspectiva, Walmart site here in Israel. And today, we're not going to talk about the coolest Python library or the perfect machine learning algorithm that's going to make you all rich. Today, I'm going to talk about a concept I think is amazing and is going to change the world. And hopefully, by the end of my talk, you'll all feel the same. Before I came to Aspectiva, I served as a software engineer and engineering manager in various roles in the Israeli Navy. I was a lieutenant commander, and in my last role, I was a software group lead. And my story begins about four years ago when I was a software group lead in the Navy. One morning, one of my friends I worked with comes in for a coffee break. As a part of his day-to-day -day job as a project manager in the Navy, he also sails on our vessels from time to time. He has his designated role on the ship. We get to talking about a ship he was on the previous week, and he says that from the minute he onboarded the ship, he couldn't perform his duties because there was a noise coming in from one of the engines that bothered him. He said he had to find the source of the noise and see if there's a failure in one of the engines using only his ears, basically. I joked around, saying, it sounds like you need an app that listens to the engines and identifies faults instead of you. We both laughed for a couple of minutes, but then we looked at each other and said, we need an app that listens to the engines and lets us know if they have health issues. Now, when it comes to software projects or apps, I've got the experience I need. This project was different. I had to dive in matters like maintenance and engines and mechanics and whatnot. Clearly, when I started working on this project, I had nothing to do with engines and machines and maintenance. As a first step, I went to research this field called maintenance. I knew my car's maintenance routine, so I started there. Every mechanical piece requires at least two types of maintenance. When I take my car, for example, I know that every 20,000 kilometers I need to go to the shop. So I drive it to the shop and say goodbye to my car for a few hours. And during these couple of hours, the guys at the shop go over a set of actions listed on their charts. They clean the brakes or take a look at the engine, and they basically try to prevent faults from happening. At the end of the day, when I come back, I expect my car to be in hopefully a better shape. That's called preventive maintenance, defining regular maintenance periods in advance. This is meant to prevent any failure. But we all remember this one time we missed the really important meeting because the car broke down. That is in case we still remember driving to physical meetings, of course. But anyway, when a car breaks down, that's where breakdown maintenance comes in handy. Breakdown maintenance means we need to find a fix for the fault that has occurred. When it comes to cars, it's not the end of the world. I mean, we'll miss a couple of meetings or we'll have to take a bus for a week, maybe even rent a car. But when it comes to ships, it's not as simple as that. A ship has missions it needs to perform. We tell other ships to perform its missions for it while it's broken. And what if the ship needs spare parts? What if there aren't any spare parts within the country? We need to order them from abroad and pray they won't get stuck on the way. Once they actually arrive, we need to grab technicians from their current work and tell them to work on this broken piece instead. As you can see, it's a whole mess. So preventive maintenance doesn't prevent all types of faults and breakdown maintenance is just the worst case scenario. Isn't there anything in between the two? Glad you asked. There is this magical approach called predictive maintenance. You might have guessed it. This approach means we try to predict the failure before it occurs. That's how the world got to researching the field of predictive maintenance, trying to predict the fault before it happens. Like many amazing breakthroughs, NASA was the first to use predictive maintenance as well. Back in the early 90s, a group of mechanical engineers sat around a table and argued they weren't doing maintenance sufficiently enough. They were losing money. This one engineer at the back of the table raised his hand and said he had an idea. So they took 100 engines for the first predictive maintenance experiment and started collecting some data. They discovered that out of those 100 that were supposed to go on their scheduled treatment, only four actually needed attending to. So inefficient, right? How did NASA do it? NASA's predictive maintenance of that time was based on a mechanical engineering approach. The approach says, know everything there is to know about the engine. Know how it's supposed to vibrate. Know how hot or cold it's supposed to be at any given moment. And be aware of every other behavior it's supposed to have. Mechanical engineering approach is the classical physics approach. It establishes the behavior of each engine and defines the proper mechanical and movement equations. It designs the set of rules. 
There isn't just one way to do it. We need to collect data in order to test this behavior, right? And data collection can be done in many ways and from many types of sensors. We can get temperature samples or oil samples or vibration analysis samples and many other methods. For vibration analysis, for example, we know we're looking for anomalies way past the defined rule for maximum vibrations. For oil analysis, we're looking for oil contamination above the defined threshold, and so on and so forth. We have rules that tells us what the data means. This also means, in this case of my project, that I had to have a mechanical, engineering, uh, a mechanical engineer leading the way every step of the way, which got me thinking, why not use machine learning? I'd still need a mechanical engineering domain expert to explain the data well, but the change here is that this time the actual data will tell us how the engine is doing and when it's predicted to fail. As the physical approach is rule-based algorithms, I wanted to justify to myself that this machine learning direction I was taking was the right path. I took the face recognition case study as a metaphor to my engine's project. When we want to reach, teach the computer to make a distinction between two people, we know it's not simple, but we could probably work really, really hard and create a set of rules that's accurate enough to make this distinction, right? What about distinction between three people? What about a hundred people? It gets a little more difficult to do it using rule-based algorithms. Going back to our ship, as vessels advance, the set of rules we must follow grows. Maybe in the past, you could have created models that were good enough, but today ships are huge. They have hundreds of software, hardware, and mechanical systems on them. Thousands of mechanical pieces. And if that's not enough, we have a bunch of people just running around. Creating a rule-based algorithm in that hectic ecosystem is not so easy anymore. Lucky for us, the world is definitely going in the way of predictive maintenance using data science. So I had plenty of reading material and I knew where I had to begin. Fortunately for my MVP, I had point number one, all the sensors I needed already installed on the ship. I also knew as point number three says, I need my data to be time series data. This is very important since the question I was trying to answer was, how long does this engine have until it's going to fail? But point number two, where was I going to find actual machine data? It's not like I can scrape actual engines data off the web, right? I couldn't really use our real data as there wasn't enough of it at the time. Lucky for me, NASA has a very good data set full of machines data that's very well organized and has been collected for over 30 years. And it's public, and it's built for predict predictive maintenance purposes. This was a great starting point. Next was to actually work on calculating the RUL, the engine's remaining useful lifetime. I needed the alert to be, your engine's going to die in three hours, or your engine's going to break in seven hours. The goal of these three next steps is to reduce the error between the actual remaining useful lifetime and the predicted remaining useful lifetime. Point number one we started experimenting with data models. Bottom line is there is a big difference between the questions we, ask or, we asked ourselves. Is this engine faulty? Differs from how faulty is this engine or when is this engine going to break? And each question requires different recordings and different data processing. What is the most suitable approach for a predictive maintenance model? You need to start by understanding which types of failures you are trying to model, which types of outputs you would like the model to give, and what kind of data is available. For us, our problem sounded like a straightforward regression problem, since we're trying to predict something that isn't from a previously classified group. This is often the case when dealing with data collected from sensors. Point number two, feature engineering. Feature engineering is trying to find the features that are most predictive, Finding the right features was hard for us, but eventually we've come to the conclusion that temperature and maximum vibrations reduce our error in calculating the remaining useful lifetime. And finally, point number three is hyperparameter optimization, which I will not go into today. As you can see, we've collected data, chose a model, optimized, just like you do for all data science projects. But there are a few things you need to keep in mind when it comes specifically to predictive maintenance. A data set for predictive maintenance can face a big problem of class imbalance, where you have plenty of data for working and healthy engine data, and a lot less, much, much less data on faulty engines or unhealthy engines. This is just like click prediction problems. A lot of people don't press the ad, a lot less people do actually press it. 
And this makes sense. I mean, we do, it's not that cars break every day, right? Or we wouldn't have bought them, especially ships. This data imbalance might lead to models with very high accuracy, but poor prediction performance in real life. Avoiding class imbalance by acquiring this faulty engine's data is not so simple, right? You can't scrape the web and get faulty engine's data. Cars don't break, out, don't break down all the time. You need actual sensors on the actual engines to collect the data. There are many methods to get this faulty or unhealthy engine's data. For example, fix your car every 40,000 kilometers instead of 20,000 kilometers and gain some extra faulty data. And the accuracy challenge. We all want our models to be as accurate as possible. We measure our accuracy using precision and recall. Precision gives us the ratio between all the predicted faults to all the actual faults. This includes false positives, predicted faults that turned out not being faults. In real life, this means paying more, more money on maintenance routines than is actually needed. Recall gives us the ratio between all true positives divided by true positives and false negatives. False negatives here means that there was a fault and the system hasn't identified it. When it comes to precision and recall, I can't win them both. In my case, I need to fight for a better recall. I'd rather pay more money for some extra false positives than one false negative, which can mean a failure in the middle of the ocean. To sum up, you go through the pre-processing steps, including feature engineering and hyperparameter optimization. You evaluate your model's accuracy, and this is the part where you decide whether you need to keep on optimizing the results or not. The most important thing for predictive maintenance-based apps is to leave the lab and start testing your model in the real world, ASAP. This is more important than trying to get the model to be as accurate as it is. Facing reality here is super, super critical. When I was a teenager and I used to take my parents' car, I was really scared to get stuck somewhere. So knowing the state of the car and if and when it's going to break would have really calmed me down. Today I don't have to dream. Predictive maintenance is not something of the future. It's happening right now. And I was lucky enough to initiate it for my organization. Now is where you come in. Predictive maintenance is the bridge between the past of the traditional industries, mechanical industries, and the future of AI. I invite you all to do predictive maintenance with me. Let's do machine learning for machines together. Thank you for being with me today. Feel free to reach out.
Hi, everyone. I'm super excited to be here with women on stage, and this talk is going to be about deep speech recognition. Uh, a few words about me. Uh, my name is Luba Port. I'm an NLP developer and researcher in City Innovation Lab in Tel Aviv. I love the combination of linguistics and programming, and I hold a master's degree in computer science and NLP from Bar Ilan University. Today, we're going to try to figure out what is speech recognition? What do we need it for? We're going to talk about modern implementations with deep learning and how human knowledge is integrated into these implementations. But first, I want to introduce you to my grandma. So my grandma is an independent and a vibrant woman until it comes to using a computer. Because then she faces challenges on a daily basis. For example, when she needs to order pills on the health services app. It's hard for people like her. So if only a computer could understand us just by speaking to it. For example, my grandma could just say, Dear computer, I need a prescription for my pills. So then it would probably be super helpful for people like my grandma and other seniors, people with different disabilities, and come to think about it, probably all of us. Well, recently this has become reality because Systems like these are becoming increasingly popular, uh, such as home virtual assistants, smartwatches, and on our smartphones. So this is awesome. But how do these systems work? Well, first, we need to recognize the spoken word. That means translate the sound into text. And then we want to understand the text and perform the, the action, perform the required action. Well, in this talk, we focus only on the first part. The first part is called speech recognition. So what is speech recognition? <clears throat> Speech recognition is the task of converting sound waves into text. Speech recognition has been researched for many, many years now, but only recently has it become reliable enough to be practically usable. And why is that? Well, the answer is deep learning. Deep learning is a machine learning technique which has gained so much popularity in the past decade. Deep learning is often perceived as a black box, which all you need to do is provide it with enough examples of inputs and outputs, and it just magically finds the right mapping between them. So in the case of speech recognition, you should provide examples of sound waves and the corresponding text, and it will learn how to map between them. But is it, in fact, a magical black box? Well, not quite. Because knowledge about the problem is leveraged to help the system learn more efficiently. It is used both in the input to the neural network and in the output from the neural network. Let's look at the input. Sound waves are combined of multiple frequencies. And we want the neural, so we break the sound into the frequencies, but the neural, we want the neural network only to focus on the frequencies which are produced by humans and captured by the human ear. The way we represent the sound waves is by using a spectrogram. A spectrogram is a scale of frequencies 
from low to high, where each color represents the level of energy that is in every frequency. Where, where red represents high intensity of energy and blue represents low energy. We can see here that we have high energy for the lower frequencies and low energy for the higher frequencies. So this would typically represent a male voice. So this is a spectrogram for just one small time frame. For example, 100 milliseconds. And this would be a representation of another 100 milliseconds. And this would be a representation of an entire word. So we leverage our knowledge about the frequencies to represent the input more efficiently. But what happens on the output? So on the output, we want the neural network to find the most probable word, right? But what happens if two different words sound similar? Let's listen to this. Bill. Let's hear this again. Bill. Bill. So it sounds like he said Bill. But is it possible that perhaps it was Bill? I'm not entirely sure, but luckily we have the context of the sentence to help us decide. So if we've seen so far, you need to swallow a, then we'd expect the next word to be pill. But if we've seen you have to pay the, then probably the next word would be bill. But how can the system leverage the frequency of these words to predict the next one? Well, the way we do it is we calculate probabilities of sequences of words from corpora such as books and news articles. So uh, if I have a sequence, uh, I need a prescription for my. So we would want the probability of the next word being killed to be quite high. But uh, on the other hand, we want the, pro the probability of the next word being built to be very low because it doesn't make any sense. So this is called language model. And language model helps the system return sentences which make sense. And also it helps us extend or limit our vocabulary. So to sum it all up, let's look at the entire process. Grandma says, I need prescription for my pills. The sound wave is sent into the neural network after being translated into the relevant frequencies. The neural network finds several probable options and the language model chooses the best one given the context. So the great work that's being done for NLP and signal processing can help people like my grandma feel much more comfortable in the modern world. Thank you so much for listening. If you have any questions or comments, please feel free to find me at my LinkedIn account or my email. Thank you very much and bye-bye.
Hi everyone, thanks for joining into my talk. My name is Mirav and today I will discuss how we can use data science for biological research. So quick hello, hi, I'm Mirav. I'm a data scientist at Orthomize. And back in the past, I did a master's degree in bioinformatics where I focused on the microbiome. So I analyzed many data sets, I answered many biological questions, and I also developed algorithms for research of the field. In my spare time, I write blog posts about data-related topics, which you can find on Medium. And fun fact, I used to have a podcast about science where I interviewed other researchers about their work. So what are we going to do today? First, I want to put us all on the same page in terms of terminology. So I will explain what the microbiome means and why it is so interesting and important. Then I will show and explain how we represent the microbiome numerically so we can apply data science on it. Then I will show one cool thing we did with data science on such a data set. And eventually I'll wrap everything up and show how we go from data science results to biological insights. So what is this microbiome thingy you are so obsessed with, my love? Well, according to Science Magazine's definition, the microbiome is the entire collection of microorganisms in a specific niche. And by niche, we mean a specific location. And that could be anywhere you can think of. It can be an organ in the body, and it can also be exterior, for example, a spot in the desert or the sea. So just to give an example, I once interviewed this researcher who studies the ocean, and he told me that one way for him to know what's going on in the depths of the sea is to look at the bacteria that live there and compare it to bacteria that used to live there one year ago, two years ago, uh, maybe longer ago. And that gives him a decent idea of what's going on in there. But the sea is very far from us, so let's stick to our bodies. And in our bodies, it is known that the bacteria is present in every organ and they're involved in nearly every possible biological function you can think of. So just to name a few, we know that there is microbiome in the brain and they're involved in many interesting things there. For example, they mediate hormone secretion, which influence how we behave and feel. They are involved in obesity and metabolism. They're involved in immune response and allergy. They're influencing pregnancy and also fertility. They influence how the body responds to cancer, and they have also been tested as a way to treat cancer. And last but not least, they also affect our mental state. So depression, anxiety, bipolar disorder, all those things are related to bacteria and uh, the other way around. So what I need you to remember from this is that the microbiome is the microbial community in a specific location. So we're all convinced by now that the microbiome is important and interesting, but we also know that to do data science, we need a table with numbers, right? So how do we get from a bunch of bacteria in the body to a table with numbers we can feed our algorithms with? Well, in one word, sequencing. And the pipeline is as follows. First thing we do is we take a sample from the niche we're currently exploring. So if we're talking about the sea, we will take a bit of water, and if we're talking about the mouth, we'll take a bit of spit. Then we'll do DNA extraction. So this means that from each sample we collected, we will pull out all the genetic material we can find in it. Then we will do sequencing. So a small reminder from your biology class, DNA is a double-stranded structure, which is made from nucleotides. And we have four types of nucleotides, which we represent with one of the following letters, A, C, T, or G. And you can imagine the DNA as a necklace where each bit is a nucleotide. And when we sequence it, we basically put it through a machine that can tell us for each bit which of the nucleotides it is. And it also writes it down for us. How convenient. So the output of this phase is a text file with a sequence for each of the bacteria we found in our sample. But one thing the machine doesn't know to tell us is to which bacteria the sequence belongs. It can only tell us the nucleotides. Well, for that, we have a database with many sequences of bacteria that the scientists already knew and they sequenced. And in the database, for each known bacteria, we have its sequence and its name attached to it. Again, convenient. So what we do now is we take each of the sequences we found in the sample and we compare it to each of the sequences we have in the database. 
And once we find one that is over some percentage similar to the sequence we have, we say that our sequence is of that type. So eventually we get this beautiful table where each column represents a bacteria and each row represents an individual from whom we took the sample. And each cell, each cell represents the concentration of the bacteria inside this individual. Very easy. So now that we have data, let's do some data science. So how many of you know what mucositis is? Very good. So I hope today will be the first and last time you hear about this. Mucositis is an inflammation that results in wounds inside the mouth. And everyone that goes through bone marrow transplantation gets it. And an interesting thing about it is that there is a big diversity in how patients experience this inflammation. So after the transplantation, we go to patients and we see in each of their mouths wounds. So we know that everyone has it. But when we ask them about it, some of, these say, some of them say that they can hardly feel it. And some of them suffer so badly that they can hardly speak or eat. Now, there is medication you can give in advance to stop this from occurring. But one thing, it costs money. And second thing, usually the doctors prefer not to give it because the body, when it's going through transplantation, it's already overloaded, right? It has cancer. The transplantation is very weakening. It's been treated with other things at this point. So the doctors prefer not to load it anymore. And they also say that if I don't know which of the patients will suffer, then I prefer to not risk it and just not give it to anyone. The worst case, some will have a bad time. But what if there were nine little creatures that could tell us in advance even before the transplantation, which of the patients will suffer from mucositis really bad and which won't. So we know who to give the medication to. So luckily there are, they're called the microbiome. And long story short, at some point of my master's degree, I was asked to see if we can use the microbiome in the mouths of patients before the transplantation to predict how bad they will suffer from the mucositis after. So we went to the patient, we took a sample from their mouth, we extracted the DNA, we sequenced it, and we found this beautiful table. Then after the transplantation, we went back to them and we asked how bad do they suffer from mucositis? So for those who said they suffer badly, we labeled their sample as one. And to those who said they hardly felt it, we labeled the sample as zero. And after some efforts, I managed to build a classifier, a random forest, if you're really interested, that could, um, do the prediction pretty accurately. So congratulations, a POC is born. We can say who will suffer from mucositis real badly and who won't. So this is an example of something cool and meaningful we can do with data science applied on microbiome. But this is pure data science and I promised you biological insights. So let's go back to biology and see how we go from the data science results to new insights. So if you remember when I showed you the table of the microbiome, now I'll show it again now, you can see that our features are basically the bacteria. So once I have a classifier to distinguish between, for example, sick and healthy patients, then I can use feature importance to extract a list of the bacteria that was meaningful to the model's decision. And I'll take this list of bacteria and I'll go to the literature and I'll see if I can cross information between what is known on this bacteria and what is known on this condition to learn new things about both or maybe only the condition. So to give a practical example, let's imagine that I have a data set taken from Crohn patients. And some of them are suffering from flare, which means that their Crohn is losing it. They suffer from its symptoms. And some of them don't, they don't feel the crown at the moment. Now let's imagine that I built a decision tree to distinguish the sick from the healthy. And that in this decision tree, I found out that for some bacteria, when its levels are over 43, then the patient is sick. And when it's longer than 43, then the patient is healthy. Let's also imagine that I took this bacteria and I went to the literature and I learned that this one thrives on glucose. So one easy conclusion would be to say, well, 
Dear chronic patients, if you don't want to suffer flare, then you might want to go easy on the sugar, right? Because when you eat sugar, you know sure this bacteria directly, its levels rises and you suffer from attacks. And of course, this is very basic. I ignore many complexities. I ignore uh, dependencies between the bacteria. I ignore also causality, just to make the point clear. So um, that's what would happen if life was really simple. Another thing that could happen when you went to the literature is that I found that this bacteria doesn't necessarily thrive on glucose, but it does um, secrete some compound that uh, contributes to the attack or that it depends on some bacteria that does something else that influences the um, attack. So this is a bit abstract, but the thing is that sometimes when we go to the literature, we learn that the bacteria is involved in some biological process that affects the condition we learn about now. And this is teaching us something about the mechanism of the condition we're studying. And that's how new insights are born. And that pretty much wraps up everything I wanted to say today about the microbiome. I'm free to answer questions if you want, and please feel free to email me if you think about anything later. Thank you so much for your time. I hope you find this valuable, and let's be in touch on LinkedIn. Thank you. <sighs> we finished our second day. Our conference is finally over and we couldn't be more thrilled you were here with us. Thanks again to all of our amazing sponsors. We truly, truly couldn't have done this without you. Your companies are true allies helping us to support diversity and being part of the change where women will make 50% of tech speakers worldwide. Thanks to all of the people who were involved in making it happen, helping us to make our dream come true. To the speakers and keynote speakers at the conference, you are truly amazing. We're counting on you to be the next thought leaders of the entire tech industry. Thanks to Event Handler for producing the conference, to Microsoft and Baot community for turning the Academy course from a dream to reality, and obviously to all of our course mentors and world-class instructors. Be sure to follow us on social media, invite our speakers to speak at your next event, register as a speaker on our platform yourself, or register to the next round of the Speakers Academy. My name is Moran Weber, and on behalf of me and women on stage, we thank you for being here with us, and we hope to see you soon at our next conference. Goodbye.